welcome to Poetic Lines, where writers make the language sing. Today my guest is Daniel Bosch, an award-winning poet and teacher who has fascinating ideas about what constitutes good poetry and how writers should be educated. Daniel knows a great deal about instructing students because he has taught at Buckingham, Brown, and Nichols, Harvard University, Walnut Hill School for the Arts, and Tufts University. His work in the classroom is so effective that in 2011, he was honored with a Presidential Recognition Award by the U.S. Department of Education for his teaching of creative writing. Daniel also teaches people through his own poetry. In Crucible, his first book, Daniel looks to both great writers and simple pleasures in order to explore the richness of the genre and what it means to live as a poet. Daniel's poems have appeared in many journals, including Poetry, Slate, The Times Literary Supplement, The New Republic, and The Paris Review. His essays about poetry have appeared in Contemporary Poetry Review, Arts Fuse, and The Critical Flame. Daniel has also served as poetry editor of the Harvard Review, and I'm delighted to have him here today. Daniel, welcome. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. It's a pleasure. So you have a poem that you're going to share with us? Yeah, I'll start with a book, uh, a poem from my book, Crucible, called Tree of Knowledge. Tree of Knowledge. If you know the name of the poem you would like to hear, press one now. To search the index for a poem or poet, press two now. For critical assessment of a poem, press three now. To speak with a poet, Hold the line or press zero at any time. The poem you have selected, Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening, is currently in use. Please select another. The poem you have selected, To Autumn, is currently in use. Please select another. The poem you have selected, Because I Could Not Stop for Death, is no longer in service. Please hold the line for critical assessment. For definitions of kindness, Press one now. To hear other reasons why death stops, press two now. If you feel as though the top of your head has physically been taken off, press three now. For other poems about death, or for death's current itinerary, hold the line and a poet will answer. For 13 ways of looking at a blackbird, press one now. If the mind of the tree and the mind of the bird are one, press two at any time. To have a mind of winter, press three now. For ideas about the thing, press four now. For the thing itself, or to compose your own poem, please hold the line. For the word heart, press one now. For the word tears, press two now. For the words eye, cheek, lip, or brow, search for done. When thou hast done, press three to return to the main menu. The word heart is currently in use. Please select another. The word beating is currently in use. Please select another. The word twittering is no longer in service. For help in choosing between two roads, please hold the line and a poet will answer. To make it new, press pound. For God's sake, hold your tongue and let me love. Press one now. If you can keep your head while those around you, Press two now. To three posts driven upright in the ground, press three now. To reap a time to sow, please hold the line and a poet will ask you if you know the name of the poem you would like to hear. I love that poem because it is playful in some ways and yet very serious in others. And it also takes an experience that everybody has had going through that list of options. And s starts from there, but then takes the, the reader into a whole new understanding of literature and a new way of interacting with literature. That's what I love about <laughs> it. But when you think about the poem, what comes to mind? Um, for me, uh, it is an excellent example of uh, a major concern for me, which is the mixing of high and low, of the kind of mundane, the phone tree waiting to press a button, 
uh, all that wasted time that we have, and and then the kind of sublimity of, of poetry, and um, so uh, I, you know, I just tried to figure out a way to exploit that. I mean, I knew that there was this experience you're referring to um, that is so common, so shared, and um, I wanted to mix poetry with it to to uh, take pieces of famous poems and and uh, kind of insert them into that format. And if you think about uh, poetry having form, uh, fundamentally having form, at least that's what I believe, um, and then you think about this kind of mundane form of the phone tree and, and, and the repetition and the, <laughs> the sequencing of those commands um, and requests and questions, uh, I feel like I'm mixing these two very formal worlds, you know, the world of the poem and the world of, of the phone tree. Um, I'll also say that, that um, I mean, it's clearly a poem in some ways about death, you know, uh, the Dickinson reference and um, uh, some of the other references, the Frost reference. Um, but it's also a, a poem um, that allows me to kind of punningly uh, suggest some of my concerns as a poet. You know, please hold the line. Uh, please cleave to this this thing that is so important about poetry. Um, uh, let's let's not give up on the past, even as we're inventing new forms. And I, I mean, I, it's kind of crazy to say that the the phone tree is a form, but um, uh, that's the kind of craziness I'm interested in. Mm. Now you've mentioned some of the things that I assume you discuss with students, the mixing yeah. of high and low, yeah. and also using the forms and structures from the past and bringing them into contemporary life. Yeah. Those are great lessons for students and probably also very refreshing for viewers to hear. Yeah. But before we get into what you teach, I think a lot of people would like to hear a little bit about your own journey as a poet, because before you became an educator, you had an education as a poet. Yeah. So let's start from the very beginning. Okay. You were five years old, and you wrote a poem. Yeah. Um, I would say that uh, my principal uh, experience of language, rhythmic language or verse, uh, when I was very young was in church. Um, I was raised <coughs> Catholic, and uh, the going to, to Mass and um, hearing this rhythmic language over and over again, the liturgy, uh, was very powerful for me. And uh, then in my parochial school in first grade, I was assigned, as it was everyone else, the opportunity to write a poem. And uh, I took it and ran with it, and the poem was celebrated by the, um, the nun who was my teacher in first grade. And, uh, you know, I. Uh, it was an institution telling me that something I had enjoyed doing <laughs> was also really good. Um, it happened also to please my mom, uh, which was a big deal for uh, this particular young boy. Uh, and um, so it clicked. And uh, honestly, Elizabeth, it's strange to say, but I, I really decided to be a poet like that day. Like, and I never considered doing anything else with my life since that time. That you know, I've made a living many different ways, many different jobs. But um, uh, it's a little bit arbitrary, but it's also not arbitrary because there's fundamental pleasures involved. You know, uh, the notion of kind of enjoying language, um, being finding a way to do it, to do something you enjoy in a way that is institutionally supported, um, and then also you know just pleasing people. In 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 this case, my mom, but also just I. Uh, the notion of poems as gifts, as making things that, that please people, has always been around my poetry. Mm -hmm. um, I was luckily not further educated in poetry, so there wasn't any poetry hanging around my house. Uh, my parents read, but they, they read um, not very sophisticated literature, uh, but they were constantly reading, and it was a, a good example to me to see that. But um, I knew I was going to be a poet, but didn't read any poetry mm -hmm. until I was about 20. Mm -hmm. Now, um, why do you say, luckily, there wasn't much uh, poetry around you? What was the, the benefit uh, of not having I think, an influence early on? I think that it kept it private for me. It kept it uh, personal. Uh, my relationship to writing was personal and private for a long time then. Um, 
but I also didn't get misinformed. And I think that mm -hmm. um, my experience as being an a educator, high school age writers, um, uh, one of the reasons I got into that, when I, you know, when I left Harvard to go to Walnut Hill School for the Arts, I thought, here's a chance <laughs> to get to kids before someone else has told them, you know, that they need to do this or that, and it's kind mm -hmm. of misguided them or, or given them a, a narrow view of what might be possible uh, in the craft of poetry for them. Um, so I might be able to get in before any damage is done, or, or, or to help set the fundamentals in a, in a, in a. Um, uh, firmer and, and actually more flexible way. So mm -hmm. uh, I think it was a blessing in some sense that I didn't have a, 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 a mentor until I was older. Um, actually, when I was in college, I had my first poetry teacher mm -hmm. and really had uh, deliberate and uh, incredibly, uh, um, uh, I mean, the teacher I had in, in, at New College in, in Florida, Mac Miller, was an incredible crafter of how, of, of of education of young poets. I mean, he had a system. It was, um, it was uh, amazing, and, and it's a system that I've basically adopted mm -hmm. um, uh, in terms of structuring uh, workshops. Um, yeah, so it was a blessing, I think. When I finally did encounter powerful poetry minds, I was already a, a stronger person. You know, I wasn't 13. I wasn't 15. I was 21, 22. You know. Uh, better able to think about what um, mattered to me as a person, and, and th I think so. Mm -hmm. What were some of the important things that you learned from Mac Miller? What was, say, the most important lesson? Um, well, I'll I'll, I'll, sw I'll swerve away from what he taught me about writing. Mm -hmm. uh, my own work and say that as a teacher, he taught me the value of the anonymous workshop. So the workshops mm -hmm. that I teach um, are almost uh, uh, exclusively anonymous. And um, that means that the students work, uh, as a teacher I know who wrote what, but the students turn in work that is anonymous and it's discussed anonymously. And mm -hmm. um, this is a really powerful tool because you get uh, a degree of honesty and a degree of criticism that I just don't believe is available. Um, even in the best um, of other kinds of workshops. Um, and, um, and then, I'll, I'll, you know, I, if Mac were here, he'd smile and have a sip of a beer, but uh, I'll tell a kind of negative thing I learned from him is, uh, about my poetry is that um, Mac had a, a fault as a teacher, which I think is that he was afraid that his students would be too influenced by really great poetry. Um, so he never introduced, he, I mean, he taught me so much about poetry, but never introduced me to Auden. And uh, this would be, you know, one thing if he didn't like Auden. But um, I'll never forget going to meet his son up at his house one day. And his son comes ambling across the room and he says, Daniel, I want you to meet my son, Auden. <laughs> and I, <laughs> I nearly, I just didn't know, you know, it didn't really mean, I mean, I knew that there was this great British poet, and I knew that, now I knew that Mac loved him, and he did love him, but he was also afraid that it would be too influential. And um, I've gone in the opposite direction in terms of a teacher, uh, as a teacher. I think that the, um, the most powerful writers that you can possibly put students in touch with early, the better, you know. Um, and and I, I try never to be afraid of my students or to think that they will be um, squashed by someone truly great like Auden or, mm -hmm. or you know, Dante or Cervantes or something. I mean, I've always, mm -hmm. uh, in my own teaching, just tried to go, let's, steer, let's go right at them. Let's see what we can learn from them. Let's, you know, borrow mm -hmm. from them, steal from them, take from them. Um, they're not somebody you, needed to be, you need to be protected from. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a lot of people worry that in addition to being squashed, young writers might look at the great poems and think, oh, well, that doesn't have any connection to me. Yeah. They might feel distanced from great literature. Yeah. How do you help your students get past that? Uh, well, first of all, we read everything aloud. You know, when mm -hmm. I t taught at Walnut Hill, um, again, this uh, writing curriculum at Walnut Hill was mine to design. so. Uh, I designed it, and we would spend two weeks at the beginning of a term reading something amazing aloud, just in a circle, 
you know, there would be 12 or 15 of us. Sometimes some faculty would join us for three hours in the afternoon if they had time. Um, and we would read all of Don Quixote <laughs> uh, in translation, of course. Or we read almost all of Montaigne's essays. You know, and, and these are things that, that uh, 12 and 13 year olds would have read in the 17th or 18th century. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but somehow we got convinced that they're too hard for young people. Um, which is nonsense. Um, they're absolutely wonderful. And if you have someone who's willing to sound it out with you and, and laugh at the right places and indicate to you that is indeed uh, that Cervantes is having a lot of fun or that Montaigne is having a lot of fun, they will get the fun too. And they will understand that, that these people are um, you, know, pulling, you know, pulling these massive works together from all kinds of things. I mean, I guess I just want to say that you know, uh, from my experience of literature, uh, the best of it, uh, um, Chaucer, Milton, Dante, it, 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 it's every, I mean, how could you, how could you not, <laughs> if you say it aloud, if you attend to it, if you open yourself up to it, not find yourself in some way reflected in it, you know, mm -hmm. there's, there's all the anxieties, all the laughter, all the sublimity and joy, um, you know, it's all in these pieces, and, um, uh, you just need to say, come on, come on, kids. <laughs> we're going to go do this. Yes, mm -hmm. it's hard. Yeah, it's hard to read a long book, but mm -hmm. we're going to do it together. Mm -hmm. and, um, mm -hmm. and, you know, then forever, these people are on their side. You know, and that's, you know, if I feel good about the gift I gave uh, to any students uh, at Walnut Hill, it's, it's that their library is now full of friends. You know, mm -hmm. it's not something to be um, afraid of. And they, they go right to the library and they say, I. I don't know what to write about today. I will go, I'll pull something down off a shelf, and in that book I'm liable to find something I can use. Mm -hmm. hmm. Tell us a little bit more about your evolution as both a poet and a teacher. Okay. You mentioned going to college and what Mac Miller did yeah. for you. After you left that university, what happened? Well, um, I graduated, uh, well, first of all, I went to four undergraduate schools, so I, I was quite um, peripatetic there early on. Uh, but uh, I did graduate from New College in 1985, and then I went to graduate school at Rice University, where I had um, a wonderful advisor, Edward Snow, the translator of Rilke, was my graduate advisor. Um, while I was in Houston, I also got to work with Richard Howard, uh, who mm -hmm. was at the University of Houston at the time and was kind enough to kind of coach me and um, took me under his wing for a little bit. And uh, um, it was Richard who first said to me, um, why is that, <laughs> pointing to something I had put in front of him, why is that a line? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I had no answer, you know, and I, I, mm -hmm. I'd obviously been a serious student of poetry under Max tutelage and, you know, mm -hmm. trying to make it happen on my own for years already, and uh, I didn't have an answer. I didn't uh, understand the importance of the line of verse um, as a construction tool um, at that point. Um, so that was a huge moment. Um, mm -hmm. I left Houston and came to Boston in 1987, really deliberately looking to work with Derek Walcott, whom mm -hmm. uh, I had run into his work. Um, Edward Snow had given me uh, um, uh, the heads up on Walcott, and I saw Walcott's work, and I knew that there was no one else um, on or in Earth on the Earth that I wanted to uh, work with. That, um, mm -hmm. So I came here hoping to uh, be able to work with him and. Um, uh, at first, I was too afraid to meet him, although I would you know, go to readings and be like 15 feet away from him, but I just couldn't bring myself to say, hey, you know, you know Richard was telling me, oh, go just introduce him, tell him you know, introduce yourself, tell him you know me. Mm. But I was too nervous, so. Uh, um, eventually, I applied to the BU program, which was great, and uh, got my master's there, studying with Derek, and um, uh, then taught at BU, and, uh, you know, it, it was, uh, Derek, who um, took Richard's lesson one step further, and uh, I remember when he was first looking at some of my work, he uh, looked at a long poem of mine, got to the second page, around, it was like a 110 line poem, around, page, around line 85, he put his finger down and he said, this, this is a good line. Mm. And I was like, whoa, there's that line thing again. Mm -hmm. um, and he said, looking up to me, he said, why aren't they all that good? <laughs> and um, Again, I was crestfallen, but I realized mm -hmm. that I had been 
I was now in the stand, you know, in the room with someone who had world standards, not mm -hmm. not standards like you know, can you publish in this magazine or mm -hmm. you know, but mm -hmm. they're thinking, how good are you? You know, I mean, if you can make a good line, that is wonderful. That's a mm -hmm. magical thing. Mm -hmm. Let's have 14 in a row. <laughs> Let's have 20 in a row. You know, mm -hmm. and that was a big challenge. What makes a good line? Um, that's a hard thing. Uh, because, you know, we don't have 10 weeks for me to explain it to you. Uh, well, let me ask it this yeah. way. If you see a good line, what stands out to you about it? Is okay. it the energy in, in that segment of language? Is it the imagery? Is it the way the whole thing holds together? Well, here's what I'm, here's what I'm thinking. Um, Poetry is very old, and in my view, um, poets uh, up until about 110 years ago um, pretty much wrote in measure. They, they, they wrote in measures that they knew or inherited, and um, they exploited these measures. They would choose them. You know, um, in, in Indian languages, there are something like 220 measures, um, and, and they're all well known and they're exploited for different kinds of things. There are mnemonic names for them. Um, uh, it's it's a it's a the idea of, of choosing a measure to accomplish a certain poetic goal is very common there, not so much in English. But you know, for instance, we have uh, uh, iambic pentameter, which is a common the most common measure in English, which is used for certain kinds of things, as opposed to iambic tentameter, which is chosen for other purposes, usually for instance comic, as opposed to the pentameter. Mm -hmm. So the notion of choosing a measure for the job you have to do as a poet is in our tradition. Um, so let's say that a poet already um, is, is operating in a certain measure, then uh, you have um, um, a standard against which you're, you're judging. You know, the, the line begins here and it ends here, and what does it do between that beginning and that end? What, and what relationship does that line establish with the other lines in a poem? Mm -hmm. um, so it's a, you know, when you ask, so what's a good line? I mean, it depends on the context of mm -hmm. the poem and its relationship to other lines in the poem. But that said, you know, I'm looking for some sorts of events, um, mm -hmm. uh, sonic events or imagistic events that are happening or syntactic events that are happening in the line. It, I don't think it should be flat. Mm -hmm. Our prose world is flat, you know. Um, if you know the name of the poem you want to hear, press two now or whatever. Yeah. That's a pretty flat thing unless you build it into a measure that begins to make it pop a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, but um, uh, within any given measure, I, I, I'm looking for sonic events. I'm, I'm thinking, Robert Lowell said, um, uh, a, a poem is an event, not the record of an event. Mm which is a fabulous yeah. quote to just kind of mm -hmm. ponder. Mm -hmm. But I also think that a line ought to be an event, mm -hmm. not just a bunch of words that comes from the left to the right and then mm -hmm. somehow breaks, but certain things should happen in it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and once you introduce this notion to, say, students, then they go, oh my gosh. You know, and this is what Richard and Derek did for me, is they made me conscious um, at my kind of late date that I should be trying to make things happen in my lines and, and then also in my other units of, of construction. Mm -hmm. We are getting down to the last few minutes, so I'm going to ask you a question about projects that yeah. you have had. And then I'll have you read one of the fruit poems. Okay. So tell us a little bit about that project. You told me that you spent months just yeah. really focused on fruit. What did that do for you as a writer? Um, it was very liberating when this happened, Elizabeth, because uh, I had never um, uh, known before the fruit poems that I was going to write a particular kind of poem. Mm -hmm. And when this muse kind of descended on me and I decided that, you know, I, f I knew that I was going to focus on these things, um, uh, it was wonderful. I mean, I, 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 all of my poetic energy, all of my, um, when I felt that thing, oh, you know, maybe I'm going to write a poem, I, I knew where it was going to go. Mm -hmm. And it was a matter of kind of listening to myself and looking at the world and paying attention for a little bit to decide which fruit would it be, and then to think about what kind of uh, line structure I wanted to use, and just mm -hmm. to see where it would go. Mm -hmm. And this lasted for about 14 months. 
and uh, that was a long stretch to be just thinking, okay, everything's going into fruit, and I mm -hmm. knew it was going into fruit, mm -hmm. and it was it was wonderful um, to be able to do that. And subsequently, I've had a couple other um, experiences where a project has uh, descended on me or been found, and then really consumed. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and and uh, to all my poetic energy went into it. Now, very quickly, what fruit was it that started you on this project? Um, it was the first. The orange poem was first, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and um, if I remember right, it was just thinking about an orange, and you know, it begins you, thick-skinned, global prison, and mm -hmm. just thinking about the container aspect of the orange mm -hmm. um, that just got me going. Well, I love that description because it is so vibrant mm. and so right and yet so unexpected at the same time. And I think often good poetry is like that. It's unexpected in some ways and so right mm. in other ways. Yeah. So please read one of the fruit poems okay. for us. Yeah, you mentioned mango. So mm -hmm. I will read um, mango, which is the last of the 14 poems. Mango. Green silk and red silk, and even more orange silk, where a band of scars sings to the knife, don't hesitate, cut me, it's what you're for. And then the newly wet handle as I slit the rind, the gentle tugs that expose the flesh, the letting light in that feels so much like opening a blind. And then the tongue pit, how stonily it confronts its naked reflection in a flowered dish, while juice pools beneath it like a pouting lip, and I remember how I loved you once. Mm. When you look at fruit now, does it <laughs> seem to be the same kind of experience as before you wrote those poems? No, it's different, and, and uh, you know, these poems haunt all my experiences of fruit um, uh, still, of course, because um, mm -hmm. uh, it, uh, it was a big moment to, to, to have the opportunity to write these poems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those poems will haunt me mm. in a good way, and I'm sure viewers will feel that same kind of pleasure. Wow. So thank you for sharing the poems and for being here today. You're very welcome. It's been a pleasure.